I, I think that I return at the end. <laughs> okay, thank you, Savio. Boa tarde a todos. É uma honra a gente começar esse Diving Day no seu último dia, mas é o dia do aniversário do, do Charles Darwin, né? 12 de fevereiro, e a gente tem aqui o prazer de ter o doutor Douglas Futuima, tá? que vai nos agraciar aí com uma é, apresentação né, sobre o tema principal né, do todo o trabalho, de uma carreira toda aí do, do, do Charles Darwin. Tá? Então, eu vou fazer uma apresentação rápida, tanto em português quanto em inglês, né, para ele saber o que, que a gente está falando. Então, o professor Douglas Futuima né, é professor emérito da Stony Brook University, lá de Nova York, pesquisador associado do Museu Americano de História Natural, de Nova York também, né? e escreveu vários é, artigos científicos, livros, né? mas principalmente o livro-texto de evolução mais utilizado em todas as universidades do mundo todo. Né? Então, ele é muito é, conhecido, muito famoso, né? e também uma pessoa extremamente simpática. So, it's a pleasure to introduce here Dr. Douglas Futuima, he is emeritus professor at Stony Brook University and associate researcher at American Museum of Natural History and the author of the main textbook in evolution that most of the universities in, around the world use today. So it is a pleasure to, to be here. So thank you very much for making this diving day wonderful that I'm, I'm sure it will be with your presentation. Well, thank you very, very much, Fabricio, uh, for inviting me to speak. It is a great honor. It is a great pleasure. Um, I have uh, very fine memories of visiting uh, your university. I think it was uh, eight years ago or nine years ago. And uh, I wish I could be there in person to see everyone uh, instead of sitting in my study at home in, in, uh, in New York. Um, uh, yeah, shall I share a screen? Yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm not very good at the, uh, there we are. Wonderful. Uh, and, um, and so the, the, uh, uh, the, the title of my talk is, is uh, Evolution, the Most Important Theory in Biology. Um, and that is a, a, a rather large statement, but I hope that by the end you will, if you don't already agree with that, with that it is the most important theory in biology, I hope by the end you will agree that in many ways uh, the, that, that the idea of evolution is, is profoundly important. Um, the, let's, here we are. Oh, how am I? Oh, okay. Um, so we are uh, today um, uh, celebrating the, the birthday of Charles Darwin. He was born this day in 1809. Um, and we uh, very often see this picture of him on the right uh, the, as an old man with a, with a beard, but we should remember that, uh, that he was a young man also uh, before that. And in fact, uh, he began thinking about evolution uh, when he was in his 20s as a result of his voyage uh, uh, around South America. Um, and very importantly, he had the idea, he, he struggled for some years, he was convinced that, that species had evolved by some kind of natural process, but he could not figure out what that natural process might have been until he came up with the idea of natural selection when he was 29 years old. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, um, and, and another 20 years would pass before he wrote his great book, The Origin of Species, which appeared in 1859. Um, and so that was 162 years ago that, uh, that this great book appeared. And as I said, it uh, took him 20 years before he dared put everything down on paper uh, to, for public view. Um, and, uh, and much of that time, he was busy amassing evidence of all kinds. It, it is an astonishing book, an extraordinary book. The variety of kinds of evidence that he drew on to support the idea of evolution. Um, 
But also he was, but also it took him 20 years, a long time before he published, because he was aware that this was going to be an extremely controversial topic. Uh, because after all, during his time, almost everyone supposed that each species of animal or plant, uh, and certainly humans, that each species had been individually created in the form that we see it today, that it had been individually created by God. And Darwin was well aware that to say that, in, that instead, all species had emerged through a, some natural processes from ancestors that were very, very different from the species as we see them today, he was aware that this would be extremely controversial. And outside of the halls of science, there is still some controversy. So as you know, uh, in, in, I think both in your country in Brazil, um, but certainly, especially in the United States, there is a large fraction of people who do not accept the idea of evolution and often say that it is just a theory. Um, and so I want to um, assert today that evolution is a fact. And also evolution is a theory, okay? So what do I mean by this? A fact, what I mean by saying that evolution is a fact is that there is so much evidence that, ev that organisms have evolved from ancestors that were very different, so much evidence today that we simply have to accept that evolution is true, that that is what has happened during the history of life. But we also speak, we, you know, biologists also speak of evolutionary theory, okay? Um, and what they would say is that the, the actual fact of organisms changing through time, how they have changed, is explained by what we call the theory of evolution. And what does that mean? Okay. At least in my country, people often use the word theory to refer to some kind of wild idea. It might be true, it might not be true, who knows, it's a speculation, okay? But in science, that is not the way the word theory is used. It doesn't mean simply a speculation. But rather, if a physicist talks about quantum theory or a chemist talks about it atomic theory, they are referring to a whole body of statements that, dis, that are very, very well supported, that are, have a great deal of evidence for them, and which express the general principles or causes of physical phenomena, of chemical phenomena. So, as, so a scientific theory is not a mere speculation. It's really a, usually a complicated set of statements that all together explain a vast variety of different observations and phenomena, whether that is in physics or in chemistry or biology. And so the word theory really is a term of honor. It's not just a wild idea. It is a term of honor. And in, in fact, in biology, the greatest contribution someone could make really would be, and it would be to be the author of, the, of a new idea that became a significant new theory that really helped to explain what before was not well understood. Um, so, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about um, evolutionary theory, but then also about what, what we, you know, what, what do we know about evolution and evolutionary biology, the field of study, the science of evolutionary biology is largely concerned with two big questions. And these were, these were the big questions that Darwin posed in his book. The first is what has actually happened, okay? How can we know what the history of living things, the history of life has been? So simply trying to, find, trying to, trying to look into the past. Um, and how do we do that? We do it by, in part by seeing fossils. So there is a fossil record, which of course is very incomplete. Just as the history of civilizations is very incomplete and it depends on manuscripts and books and, um, uh, and you know, it, it ruins of various kinds from the past and you have to piece together the full history from fragments, okay? So, um, so we infer the history of life partly from the fossil record, but also as you will see from what we call phylogeny, from piecing together the relationships among living species. And I'll give an example of that in a moment. 
The other part of, of the other main task of evolutionary biology is to understand the causes of evolution. Okay, how has it happened? What are the actual processes that are responsible for the for the changes that have taken place over the course of the history of life? And this understanding of these causes draws on really many many aspects of of, of biology, especially genetics, um, where we're interested in the origin of new variations in the various features of animals or plants or bacteria. And those variations that arise by mutation of the genes then may or may not become typical of the entire population or the entire species. And if they do, it's because what was originally a rare mutation has come to be inherited by more and more and more of the population until finally the entire population carries that mutation. And that mutation may have increased in the species by a process called genetic drift, which is simply random chance, or it may have increased by the process of natural selection, which I will talk about. Um, and this, of course, was Darwin's really great idea. How do we study evolution? Uh, how do we understand these causes? Well, in large part, it is, as in all sciences, by comparing data, comparing information on animals, plants, bacteria, viruses, we comparing data to predictions that the theory makes. If the, if the idea is true, we should expect to see some certain observations and we go out to see whether the real world corresponds to those expectations. And this can be done in many different ways that I, I really well, don't, don't, uh, can't, really can't, can't spend time on. So let's go back and just to spend a few minutes on the history of life and how we learn what has happened. Okay. And so, uh, of course, as I said, part of the answer is going to be found in the fossil record. And there are countless examples now of intermediate kinds of organisms showing at least a few of the steps by which our modern organisms have, 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 have evolved from ancestors that were very, very different. I mean, very famously, really just in the last 20 years or so, it has become clear from more and more and more fossils that birds are feathered dinosaurs. In fact, what we have found is that a lot of a lot of dinosaurs and in, in fact, but you know, bore feathers. So this is a very small species of dinosaur, Microraptor. It was about the size of a pigeon or a dove, a paloma. Okay, and in this fossil, you can see the imprints here, for example, of feathers that uh, that were both along the tail and on the front on the hands, which is to say wings, but also long feathers on the legs. So this was actually a small four-winged dinosaur that evidently could fly or at least flutter probably from one tree to another. Um, it was one of many dinosaurs now that we understand to be the group of organisms from which our modern birds evolved um, with intermediate steps as shown in this case. And of course, over the years, more and more hominid fossils, that is to say fossils of human, of, of the, the branch of the, you know, of, the, of the, the, the tree of life that includes ourselves, Homo sapiens, we have more and more hominid fossils showing over time how the small steps by which modern humans have evolved from ancestors that were much more ape-like. And so, for example, each of these points represents a, the size of the brain, the brain volume in, in, in a fossilized skull um, that's been estimated from a fossilized skull. And what we see is that over the course of the last three million years, there has been a gradual increase in the size of the brain in the hominid lineage leading up to Homo sapiens ourselves today. And so there are many examples like this. I'll give, just give one more example from the fossil record, and that is the critical steps between, between lobe-finned fishes, which existed in the Devonian period many hundreds of millions of years ago, and which gave rise to the four-legged, the tetrapod animals um, that walk on land. Um, and new fossils of this kind have been found, you know, re you know, repeatedly. This is a very famous one found in northern Canada, Tikta Alik, and it's one that fits on this sequence as you go from 
what were clearly fishes with a special kind of fin that became modified more and more as you've in these successively old younger fossils that in which that fin more and more shows the bone structure characteristic of what we call the tetrapod limb, which is to say our legs or, or arms. And you see also here that in this progression, you have the same, the same basic skull bones with changes in, you know, in the, their relative size and shape, um, and also the loss of the most posterior bones, which covered the gills uh, in these more ancient forms of fishes. And so, you know, so this is, of course, one line of evidence that says, well, we would predict, if Darwin is right, we would predict that four-legged animals on land came through some series of intermediate stages from aquatic ancestors that had fins, and there ought to be some kinds of intermediates to be found, and indeed we do find them in the fossil record. Here's another totally different kind of data, and that is piecing together the phylogeny or the tree of life that expresses what we believe to be the history of ancestry by which modern organisms have evolved. So for example, we have these two kinds of mammals that we believe came from a common ancestor, some ancestral mammal that eventually split into two lineages, one of which eventually gave rise to the spiny anteaters that lay eggs, another gave rise to all the other, most, almost all the other mammals, the placental mammals that have a uterus in which they, they carry their, 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 their embryos, okay? And, you know, and in turn, the mammals share a common ancestor with the other so-called amniote vertebrates, which is to say the reptiles, okay? And within the reptiles, we believe that there was a common ancestor that gave rise on, on one hand to the lizards and snakes, and on the other hand gave rise to the crocodiles and the closest living relatives of crocodiles, which are, believe it or not, the birds. Okay. So this, rep this represents then here our understanding of the history by which ancestors split into separate species, each of which then later on split into separate species and so on across millions of years in the process acquiring changes in their legs and, the, the, and ver their various other characteristics. This particular picture of the relationships among these different vertebrate animals was based on anatomy. That's what I've drawn here. Anatomical, especially features of the skeleton, but also some features of embryos and, and so forth, based on relatively few anatomical features. Okay. What has happened, of course, in the recent past, the last 40 years or so, is the ability to sequence the DNA. And what we now know from sequences in the genome, which are totally independent, of those characteristics that the anatomists studied, totally independent of the skeleton and so forth, from sequences in the genome, you can ask which, you know, what, do the D, what does the DNA tell us about who is most closely related to whom? And it turns out, well, the, the, you know, the spiny anteaters and the, 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 the other mammals indeed are more similar in their DNA than they are to lizards or crocodiles or birds and so forth. And in fact, you can piece together from the DNA sequences, the relationships among these different organisms and the DNA tells exactly the same story of the history of descent and relationships among these different groups of organisms. These are totally independent sources of information that tell the same story. And when you have different independent sources of data that point to the same conclusion, that support the same hypothesis, then this becomes a very strong basis for accepting that hypothesis as true. This is true throughout science. If we have independent sources of evidence that point to the same conclusion, then we feel more and more confidence that that conclusion is true. Okay. Well, of course, let's take that a little bit closer to home. And it was long understood that the closest relatives of humans are the chimpanzees and their close relative, the bonobo, and that the closest, and, and in recent years, the DNA basically told us that the chimpanzees are the closest relative of humans, and the next closest relative is the gorilla, and then the various other apes and, and monkeys. Okay. 
Um, so um, that is that is really interesting. In fact, Darwin was quite sure of this. He, you know, he knew he was quite sure that the gorillas and chimpanzees were the closest relatives of humans. And on that basis, he may essentially made a prediction. He, he, he would have called it a speculation, but we can say evolutionary science makes predictions. Here we are from Darwin's great book, The Descent of Man, in which he says that he already knows that in each big part of the world, the living mammals are closely related to the extinct species in the same region. And he says, therefore, it was probable that Africa was formerly inhabited by extinct apes closely allied to the gorilla and chimpanzee, which live in Africa. And as these two species are now man's nearest allies, nearest relatives, it is more probable that our early progenitors, our early ancestors lived on the African continent. This is 1871. This is about 50 years before any ancient hominid fossils were, had, were discovered. And what do you know? All of the ancient hominid fossil, fossil species have been found in Africa. Okay. So, you know, so Darwin was absolutely right. I mean, this was this is the kind of, of, of you know, hypothesis and 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 um, uh, conclusions, you know, and the predictions essentially that Darwin made again and again and again and again on all kinds of different topics. In this case, on where the human species originated. Okay. Now, today we can actually then go further. Well, if and say. If, if, if since humans ev evolved in Africa, obviously they traveled from Africa, they spread from Africa to colonize the rest of the world where, where native where human populations have, have, have gotten to. And they must have then gone up from Africa into Europe and Asia. And we're quite sure that from Northeastern Asia, they went into, into North America um, be, be, because the, the genetic similarity between Eastern Asian people and native North Americans. And then from North America, humans must have continued spreading down through Central America and into, and into South America. Now, if that is true, presumably every, you know, let's, let's bear in mind that in any population of humans or any other species, People, the individuals are not all genetically the same. Everyone carries some different genes from the, the person sitting next to them, okay? I have mutations in my genome, I'm quite sure, that originated in my father, new mutations that happened in my father and were passed down to me in the sperm cell that went into my, the, my, 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 my formation. Okay. Um, and your father and mother you know, basically <laughs> passed on different mutations to you. So there's a lot of genetic variation from one individual to another. Okay. But as a population colonizes, had, you know, small numbers of people you know, form a new colony and from there they spread further, each step of the way, the number of people who are colonizing is relatively small. So that means that they cannot carry with them all of the different genetic variants, variations that were present in the larger population from which they come. Okay. And so that means that the further, the more, the more, the further the colonization process went from Africa up through Asia and into North America and South America, you would expect that the amount of genetic variation, the amount of genetic differences from one individual to another would become less the, if you look at populations that are further and further away from Africa. And that is exactly the, what the data say. Okay, so on the vertical axis, we are showing here a measure of the amount of genetic difference on average, um, you know, from one person to another. And each of these points represents a population that was sampled at various distances from Africa, okay? And so the, you know, here at the right side, you have the farthest populations, native, namely populations of people native to Southern South America. And what you see then is exactly that the further you go from Africa, the less genetic variation there is in the human populations, which is of course in, an independent confirmation of if, if, and if, even if we have no fossil record whatsoever, we, from this, we would conclude that humans must have originated in Africa and spread out from there. The theory of, you know, the, the history of evolution explains so many characteristics of so many species that I literally, I could, I could talk for 
hours about that, okay? I'll just give you one example because I want to get on to many other topics, okay? Of how evolutionary history explains peculiar features of organisms, okay? I, I, do you know this plant? Is this, is this plant in, 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 much of, of, uh, in much of Latin America and the United States, this plant we call poinsettia um, is very commonly uh, used as an ornamental uh, plant around Christmas time and I think sometimes around Easter, the Pascua. Um, it is a very beautiful plant, but it's, it's very peculiar. What we, this big red thing, you know, red thing here, what we are looking at here is not a flower. It is in fact, the flowers in fact, are these little yellow things in the center. There's a whole bunch of very small flowers and those flowers do not have petals, okay? Petals are used by flowers essentially as advertisements to attract pollinators, okay, to come and, and basically deposit pollen, which goes into the formation of seeds, and to take pollen away so that the plant can be the father of other seeds of other plants elsewhere. But in this group of plants, the, 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 the gene of the very, very large genus Euphorbia, long ago they lost their petals. And so most euphorbias do not have a very effective way of advertising to attract pollinators. And so they have basically evolved changes in their leaves to serve the function of petals. They are substitutes for the petals that most other plants have in their flowers. So these red things you are looking at here are actually modified leaves. If you look at the shape and the venation on them, and you see that it's the same as the green leaf down below, except that it's red. And so if you say, well, why would, why would a plant use petals instead of, use leaves instead of petals to attract bees and other pollinators? And the answer is because back in its history, in its remote ancestor, the petals were lost and they could not be regained. And so, and so natural selection then forged a substitute for them out of whatever it had available and what it had available was leaves. Now, um, <clears throat> Uh, I want to switch now to evolutionary processes, what we now talk about you know, often as the theory of evolution. And the basic process of evolution involves new mutations of the genes, some of which affect a characteristic. Okay. Um, and often those mutations are harmful. And as such, individuals with the mutation may be less likely to survive or less likely to reproduce. And if that's the case, those mutations become eliminated from the population or they are kept down to be, to be very, very rare. Okay. But some of these mutations um, may increase in frequency. They may basically individuals that carry the mutations may end up having more descendants and passing on the mutations to more descendants, sometimes just by chance, which is a process that's called ge genetic drift, but the greatest interest sometimes by natural selection. Um, and so here is where the ecological environment of a species comes in, because that may determine whether a mutation is beneficial to the individual organisms or is harmful. Okay. And so I want to say a little bit about natural selection. And here, this is basically a diagram of how, of how natural selection works, which is to say over the course of time, we suppose we have two genotypes, each of which gives rise to offspring of exactly the same genotype. And genotype B, for some reason or other, is capable of reproducing itself and having more offspring on average than individuals of genotype A. And if that is the case, even though both of them might increase in numbers, the B genotype which is better at surviving or makes, or simply makes more babies, has, lays more eggs, or perhaps is able to fertilize more eggs, if it's male, if you're talking about males, genotype B then is basically having more offspring per individual than genotype A does. And as such, it automatically means that the B genotype will become the prevalent genotype. It makes up a greater and greater percentage of the population. So natural selection really is just a name for a difference in fitness, what we, what we call fitness among genotypes or, or, you know, or let's say among genotypes. And what do I mean by fitness? Reproductive success, the ability to survive and then to, to reproduce. And that's all that natural selection is. 
it isn't Mother Nature looking, you know, thinking about what would be nice, what would be good for this species, and somehow coming up with the, you know, the, the right solution. It's only that random mutations chain may alter characteristics, and sometimes those characteristics enhance the ability of individuals to survive or to reproduce, and so they then end up having more offspring on average. Well. In some cases, these random mutations have effects in which we can see why they would be beneficial to the individual, why they would help it in surviving or reproducing. Okay? It, there are many, many, many species of grasshoppers um, uh, and what, you know, uh, that, um, that resemble leaves. Um, you, if, you, if you've spent any time out in the fields and forests, you have certainly seen some of them. Some of them are really astonishingly similar to leaves, like this one, which lives on the ground in tropical forests, okay, in the genus Mimetica. And this is the, this is the, this is the, this is the wing of this grasshopper. Here are the legs. This is the wing of this grasshopper, and it looks like a, a dead leaf, which first of all has started to dry, so it looks a little curly. And it looks like this leaf has been eaten by some other insect, because here around this edge of the wing, it looks like the edge of a chewed leaf. And it's a leaf that has a midrib, a vein running down the middle of it. It's the most extraordinary resemblance to a dead leaf that you can imagine. Okay. It is simply the, the it's sort of the, the extreme in a variety of different grasshoppers, which to a greater or lesser extent resemble leaves. And that, of course, is advantageous because it makes them very difficult to, for predators to see them and to find them. Okay. Um, and so we can see why the mutations that would by chance have, you know, have produced some of these features, why those mutations would have enhanced the survival of the individuals with those mutations and those, and so their, their offspring, their descendants would take over the population. And often, you know, these, these, these features look as if they, they had been designed, okay? Another example would be the extraordinary, extraordinary hollow fang, fold, you know, foldable fangs of a pit viper or, or rattlesnake. I think you have one species of rattlesnake in Brazil, um, and it looks something like this. But natural selection also has given rise to some extraordinary features that at first that are really rather surprising until you understand just how natural selection works. For example, in lions, it's very commonly the case that a male will fight with another, a male, so a male lion typically has several mates, several females, okay, who are his mates. And that male lion may be replaced by another male that comes in and basically fights and, and, you know, and basically chases away that male. And that male lion who takes over a group of females very commonly will kill the babies of those females, infanticide. Okay. Absolutely horrifying, isn't it? And if you think about it, well, why would it do this? If there's, a, if there's a mutation which impels a male lion to kill the cubs like this, what that means is that those females will no longer be nursing their babies and they will then come back into reproductive condition. They will ovulate and be ready to basically make a replacement baby very soon. And that baby is going to be the child of this male. And so mutation carried by this male which impels it to kill the cubs of the females that he, that he takes over, that mutation will increase in frequency because males that, with that mutation are going to have more babies faster, more children faster. Okay. Here's another example, which is pretty horrifying. This is an, a, an oceanic bird called a booby, and they typically lay two eggs. Okay. Here is one chick that has hatched from one of those eggs, and here is the other one. And what has happened is that one of these chicks, the one that's a little bit larger and stronger, has thrown its sibling, its brother or sister, out of the nest. And that sibling is simply going to die, exposed to the hot sun. Here's that other one sheltering under the, under the mother in the shade. And the mother simply sits there watching this happen and does nothing. So this is siblicide. And what is going on here is that in seabirds of this kind, they basically can't get enough food to raise 
a large number of offspring. In fact, if they can raise, if they can feed one offspring so that that, that offspring survives and is able to go off into the world, then that, that basically takes about as much work catching fish um, as, as, these, as the parents can do. Okay? And basically they can't rear two, two babies. Okay, and so it is adaptive in some sense. It's better, the, you know, a mutation that causes one sibling to, exp, you know, to throw out the its its brother or sister. That is a mutation that is likely to to increase in frequency because it means the survival of that chick. Whereas if if the if the parents tried to feed two chicks, probably neither of them would end up being strong enough to survive. Okay, and we, we have, there's a lot of evidence of, of this, you know, of, of what I'm saying in, in quite a number of different species of birds. And so it really is from, a, from the point of view of a mutation that affects the behavior of these baby, of these chicks, from that perspective of that mutation, you know, causing, causing the baby to basically kill its brother or sister, it isn't an advantageous thing to do. That will cause the mutation to take over the population and become a characteristic of the species. Okay. Why do females lay two eggs instead of just one if they can't rear more than one offspring? Well, probably just as insurance. You know, if if you know if one if one chick you know dies or, or one egg gets eaten by a predator or something, then at least there's another there's a chance of, of reproducing successfully if there's a replacement. Darwin recognized that his principle of natural selection could explain a lot of bizarre characteristics of organisms, I mean, including what I was just talking about. He devoted The Descent of Man, that book in, in 1871, more than half of it is devoted to what he called sexual selection, a particular form of natural selection that basically involves competition for the opportunity to mate, okay, and to have offspring. And there are two ways in which usually it's the males that compete with one another, but also it can happen between females. But Darwin emphasized especially competition between males for the ability, for the ability to mate with females. And he said there are two ways in which this can happen. One way is for the males to basically fight with one another and for the winner to be the one who gets the female and, get, and gets to reproduce. And there are all kinds of bizarre characteristics, you know, that, for example, the horns of many kinds of, of, of mammals, okay. Um, but one is this beetle that you might be familiar with. It's a tropical American cerambicid beetle in which the front legs are extraordinarily elongated and they're much, much longer in the male than they are in the female. And basically what happens is that males um, uh, will meet one another on a dead tree, which is where the females come and will lay, uh, mate and lay their eggs. Um, and, the, and the males will come and basically joust with one another. Each male tries to flip the other male off the tree by putting his legs under the other male and then raising them and trying to throw that, throw that male off. Um, uh, the other way in which there can be natural selection for bizarre characteristics is that for some reason, females will often prefer to mate with males that have particular kinds of ornaments or flashy behaviors or coloration. And of course, the icon of that is the peacock in which these elongated feathers of the back, not the tail, but the back, these elongated feathers are displayed to females and experiments have been done by, sort of, for example, clipping off some of these eye spots on, these, on the tails and showing that females will not mate as readily with a male that doesn't have as many of these ornamental spots on the tail. Um, so Darwin, once again, was right. Darwin had no direct evidence of this, but since then there have been plenty of experiments showing that, um, that there can be uh, you know, that there can be sexual selection in which females prefer males with what seem to be otherwise bizarre, strange features that would be very hard to understand. Um, just, you know, one more point be before I move on to, to human aspects, and that is that now this is the age of genomics, and there are all kinds of very strange features that, that are in genomes. Once, you know, once, once we started being able to sequence the DNA of entire genomes, you know, we find that there are bizarre features. For example, there are a lot of what we, you might call dead genes, you know, genes that once upon a time were functional, but are functional no longer. 
um, they're called pseudogenes, for example. And, and usually what this involves is uh, that an, an ancestral gene somehow became duplicate. So there were a whole bunch of different copies in the genome, more copies than were really needed, so to speak. And so you get mutations in some of those copies that make, the, that make it a non-functional gene. And then it just sits there indefinitely you know, forever. Um, why would it do that? Well, maybe the gene is no longer really needed. An example is, the, is a gene which is important in, all, in mo most mammals for synthesizing vitamin C. But humans and other primates can't do that. That gene basically is a pseudogene. It is no longer functional. It's, it's there in the genome, but it, it doesn't make a proper protein that's necessary to synthesize, to synthesize vitamin C. Why is that? Well, probably because the primate ancestors of humans were like most primates today, like most monkeys and lemurs, were fruit eating and they got their ascorbic acid, they got their vitamin C from eating fruit. So it wasn't necessary to synthesize the vitamin C. Another aspect is what are called transposable elements. And this was wild when this was first discovered. And it was realized that there are these genes that basically don't do anything for the organism at all. They just make more copies of themselves that spread through the genome. And in fact, they make up more than 90% of the entire uh, human DNA, and they don't do anything that's useful for the human being. Okay? And this is true in almost all species. Okay? And it's simply because if a gene can make more copy of its, uh, copies of itself, why then it proliferates and it takes over. It's as simple as that. That's natural selection if, you know, in a way that has nothing to do with organismal function. But once you understand that natural selection is simply a, a difference in the rate at which genes make more copies of themselves, then you end up with genomes with all of this so-called junk DNA. Well, I've been trying to show then how evolutionary biology provides insights and understanding throughout the biological sciences. And I could go on at much greater length, but whether we're talking about anatomy or behavior of animals or the structure of genomes, I mean, you, you, throughout evolutionary biology provides an, a window into understanding why features are as they are, why we have, the, why, why organisms have the features that they have. But I want to turn in what in my remaining time, which I think is what, maybe about 15 minutes, um, to also review, review very quickly of the fact that uh, evolutionary, uh, evolution is important, evolutionary biology is important because it is useful to people in many different ways and more and more as time goes on. Okay. Here's one way just um, is that it uh, is that people sh people should understand that humans themselves cause evolutionary change in species that may be important to them. Okay. For example, uh, fish. Here's the species of North, you know, North Atlantic fish, the cod, which is a very, very important food fish. Um, and it is fished very heavily. And one consequence of that is because nets are used uh, to catch these fish in large part, is that the nets prefer that they tend to catch larger fish more than smaller fish, okay? Well, result of that is, if there's any genetic variation in size, okay, then the smaller fish are the ones that are going to be more likely to escape and the, more, the ones that are more likely to reproduce, and they will be passing on to their offspring genes that tend to make them small in size or genes that cause them to develop more slowly, okay, um, and, uh, or to reproduce at a smaller size. And so what you see here is that over the course of time, the average size um, and the average uh, age at maturity, here's, here's the size, here's the age at maturity, uh, evolved in the North American cod population to become smaller. Here you have you basically fish evolved to be smaller and they evolve to, uh, to reproduce when they're younger and smaller because they weren't living to be big and re to reproduce when they were large because they'd be more likely to get caught. Okay, and likewise, um, hunters in North America like to like to sh to hunt this kind of sheep and keep the large horns as a trophy. Well, of course, they always prefer to shoot the, the males that have the biggest horns, and the result of that is that there has been evolution of smaller horns 
in the bighorn population over the course of, the, of about uh, 30 years or so. Much more important, however, is that when we kill organisms, for example, with insecticides or antibiotics or herbicides, when we kill them, we are then imposing natural selection for any kinds of mutations which would enable that organism to survive, to be resistant to the chemical that we are using. And so, over, yes, and so they, we, we've known for a long time, this is an old paper, you know, but, and since then many, many more examples, but that um, more than 200 species of weedy plants have evolved to be resistant to herbicides, to weed killers. Okay? More than 500 species of insects have evolved to be resistant to insecticides. More than 1,700 species of bacteria have evolved to be resistant to various chemical antibiotics. Okay. And this is, has been called a crisis in public health. This is a really serious issue because there are some bacteria um, such as, as uh, um, um, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, dangerous bacteria that have evolved resistance to essentially all, essentially all the antibiotics, almost all the, you have to keep making new antibiotics, hoping to find one that they're not already resistant to. Yeah. This is really, really serious, okay? So pathogens evolve antibiotics, you know, and here's one of many, many examples showing how over the course of years in this particular kind of bacterium, um, as, you know, as, as a particular drug came into, a particular antibiotic came into use, then in the, show, in the blue line, why the bacteria were evolving to be more and more resistant in the red line. And this, of course, causes more, the heavier doses of the drug to be used, so more and more drug drug was being used, and the bacteria became more and more resistant over time. So this is a story that's gone on many, many times. It is really serious. And what this means is that, um, that we really have to, that, that basically an using antibiotics should be a last resort, because whenever antibiotics are being used, they are helping to create or to produce resistant germs, resistant um, uh, bacteria that are going to be ultimately more dangerous than they have be before. One issue that's been very important is the degree to which antibiotics are being used in um, domestic animals, chickens or pigs or whatever, uh, basically to help them grow. It helps them grow faster, but that also means that that is selecting for antibiotic resistant bacteria, which may very well spread from pigs to humans or from chickens to humans. So this, this, this is a really, this is evolution in action and it happens really fast. Okay. Another important application of evolutionary biology is, is tracing the spread of pathogens, okay? Because as new mutations happen, you can put together a phylogenetic tree, a tree, tree of life, so to speak, so to speak, of the different genotypes of a species of bacterium, for example, or for that matter, a kind of virus. Okay, and so here is this is a this is this shows the 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 genealogical relationships among different strains of the HIV, the human immuno, <clears throat> immunodeficiency virus, which of course, which was, which was the cause of AIDS, right? And, um, and it, by, as it underwent various kinds of mutations, the different strains in humans could then be traced to equivalent viruses in chimpanzees. And, it could, and, so, the vi and so viruses that were isolated from chimpanzees are shown in blue, and those uh, different strains of HIV that isolated from humans are shown in red. And what this shows then is that in at least three different occasions, humans picked up this virus from chimpanzees. And so you had different strains of the, vi of the virus in human populations, which had evolved from different strains being carried by chimpanzees. Um, well, that of course is what that's you know that that that's something that was extremely important during you know during during my the, my middle years you know when I was younger, it was something that I and and uh, every every other gay man was very very conscious of at that time, um, and of course now we're seeing the same thing being played out today. Here we are, I'm talking to you by Zoom instead of having the pleasure of being able to come to Brazil, right? Um, 
and you're and you probably you are all sitting in your separate homes watching this because you can't get together in you know to in in, in a public place or a university and that is and so the and so here today we're dealing with the question of where did this horrible virus come from and um, this is a phylogenetic tree, a, relation, a tree of relationships among the various viruses that are known in the group of coronaviruses. And the different colors then show, uh, show the different groups of viruses. And around the edge is the mammalian host from which the, these various viruses have been isolated over the course of the last 15 plus years, right? Um, and what you see is, and so what you see is that in one, two, three, four, five, six, six, uh, six cases, a virus has gotten into human populations. And you ask, well, what is that virus, you know, most closely related to? And here's the case in which, okay, the closest relative of the virus in humans was viruses that were isolated from bats. Okay. And you look around and you find again and again, not in every case, but in most cases, the human virus is closely related to viruses that are being carried by bats. Okay, here's another instance up here. Another instance is over here, two instances down here. Um, and so it has become now sort of a, a mantra among epidemiologists that if you get a new virus in a human population, the first thing you, the first place you should look for for, for the possible source is bats. Okay, and why that should be is a whole interesting question that I'm not sure I know enough to, to answer, uh, but it's obviously a really Im important question. Okay. Here is, um, you know, and then here's, an, here's another a paper uh, showing some particular strains of the virus that, that we're, the, the COVID-19 that we are dealing with now. And um, uh, so here is, here, this is the one we are dealing with now up at the very top. And its closest relatives that have been isolated so far anyway, um, were isolated from bats and then also from pangolins. What is a pangolin? It's a African or, or tropical Asian mammal that looks like it's called the scaly anteater is another name for it. This very, very strange and very, very endangered mammal. Um, endangered because they are eaten by people and they are found in Chinese markets. And so it is, so some viruses were found in it it doesn't necessarily mean that the pangolin was the major host from which you know, the, the, the virus spread to, to people. Um, it could very well have been bats because the, you know, but, so we don't really know exactly. Um, from the, they, from, from, from phylogenies, you can actually learn a lot from these family trees that can be pieced together in terms of who is related from whom and descended from which ancestors. And so, um, and so at this point, it's being su su suggested based on, based on these kinds of, of family trees that the pandemic indeed seems to have started back around last October, which is when it first came to light. Um, that the and here's an important point, the diversity of different strains of this virus in many different countries is pretty much equal to the entire diversity that's known from it so far all over the world which seems to mean that when it spreads, it is spread, it's being carried by a lot of people carrying a lot of different, you know, of different you know, strains of this, of this virus, okay? We're seeing that is, you know, vi virus, the virus has genes and those genes mutate just as any other genes do. They mutate at a very high rate in viruses. And, um, and so we're already finding many, many, many different mutations so that the actual sequence of the virus differs you know, very greatly from, from, you know, from one to another. And we are very concerned about some of those mutations, of course, you know, being representing adaptation to the human host, okay? Um, and, so, um, and so this is going to be really important to watch how the mutational uh, diversity and the adaptation to humans, how that is going to affect the way in which drugs and vaccines have to be developed. Um, and so we are looking at a high speed evolutionary process happening in this virus today, some of which and some of that evolution could be really dangerous. Uh, as if it were as if it weren't dangerous enough already. Okay. Um, if I can, can I have just five more minutes, I guess? Um, and I'll just mention that this is just sort of the latest 
in a number of different themes in, in what's been called evolutionary medicine. Okay, and um, this in you know obviously the the evolution of pathogens is what I've just been talking about, but understanding, for example, a lot of human genetic variation and some of which is medically significant, understanding that or that humans are not really very well adapted to the environment that the, to modern environments that we have created for you know for for ourselves. Um, and, uh, and, and in general, there are, it's really important to recognize the, the, the role of evolution in human medicine and medical research, okay? This is, these pictures are all organisms who, in which the US National Institutes of Health supports research on these species. These are model organisms that are the subject of health-related research. Why would, why would the government support medical research using fish or fruit flies or nematode worms, or for that matter, mice and rats? Okay. The only reason is there, that there are features held in common at the level of genes and genomes and many characteristics of the organism itself that are held in common between humans and other mammals, and for that matter, between humans and fish, and an amazing number that are held in common between humans and insects, you know, or worms. And for that, and the only explanation for that is common ancestry, that here is a phylogenetic tree, a family tree showing the relationships between these different organisms and humans. And there are some features such as basic DNA processing and so forth, which are held in common across all of these different organisms from bacteria to humans. That is the only you know, scientific rationale for being able to study yeast or flies and from them derive any information that could possibly be relevant to human health. The degree of similarity sometimes is extraordinary between humans and mouse. This is just one little piece of genome showing that there are exactly the same genes arrayed in the mouse chromosome as in the human chromosome in, ex in even the same positions relative to one another. Okay. Um, uh, and, um, and this turns out to these commonalities have all kinds of significance. Okay. You may know that the average amount of difference between the DNA sequences of humans and chimpanzees is about 1%. Okay. This shows for many different parts of the genome, the degree of, of, of sequence identity and you know, how, much, how similar they are. And it, it is on, on average around 1% with obviously some variation. Okay. Some genes have evolved more during the divergence since the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees and some have diverged less. Okay. Now, why would these genes over in here, they've diverged less, why would they not have changed as much between the humans and chimpanzees as these genes over here? The likely answer is that mutations to some genes are more likely to disrupt the function of the gene and therefore to be harmful to the organism. Some genes are simply more important and mutations are more likely to mess them up so that they don't do their proper function. And those mutations are therefore more, more dangerous, more deleterious. And they will then be eliminated from the population because individuals with those genes don't survive and reproduce as well. So these genes, the genes that are more similar between humans and chimpanzees are probably really more, in some sense, more important. You know, you can't mess with them as much. If you do mess with them, there's gonna be nasty consequences. And that leads to this relationship that has been found empirically, okay? Here we have for various genes, the percent of differences between, in, in the DNA, between human and chimpanzee. Over at the right end, these are genes that are pretty different between the human version and the chimpanzee version. At the left are genes that are almost identical in human and chimpanzee. These genes that are almost identical are the ones that have basically not evolved because natural selection has, has thrown out any mutations by most of the mutations that have happened in those genes. Those genes must be really important. So if you do get mutations in those genes, they probably have some nasty effect. And in fact, it turns out 
that the genes that are most similar between humans and chimpanzees are those that are most likely to already be associated with a known inherited disease in humans. Isn't that marvelous? So from the degree of sequence similarity of one gene versus another gene in chimpanzees and humans, you can kind of, you can tell which gene is more likely to cause an inherited disease and to be something that requires medical treatment. That is something that comes out of the theory of, of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, that couldn't possibly be predicted otherwise. Well, I'm going to, uh, I, I'm sort of overstayed, overstayed my time. Um, and I will just finish with, with one more <laughs> sort of bizarre case. This, this really is very bizarre. And that is the notion of genetic conflict. Okay, there are, in this, we, we, this is something that over the course of the last 20 or 30 years is something that really has been the focus of a lot of attention in evolutionary theory, developing a theory of the evolution of genetic conflict. What does that mean? What it means is that you can have two different genes in the genome, which basically have opposite effects on fitness and are, are sort of fighting with one another. Okay, and in particular, um, this, this often is, is shown in that the, the genes from one parent may conflict with the genes of another parent, okay? So a gene that is transmitted to offspring from the mother, a gene would be better if it causes that offspring. Here we're talking about humans. It would be better that this gene would be more advantageous if it causes the embryo, the, the, the fetus, to grow at a relatively low rate. Because in that, that means that it wouldn't be drawing as much on the mother for nutrition. And, you know, and of, course, the, of course, what the mother gives the, you know, is, is, is costly. You know, it costs a lot of, of energy to, for mothers to really to, to, um, to nurture their, their fetuses, right? And so a fetus that grows really, really fast is going to have a really harmful effect on the mother. Okay. Um, and so mutations that cause really fast growth of, an, you know, of a fetus are going to be deleterious, harmful from the mother's point of view. On the other hand, a gene that has come from the father, well, the father in some sense um, it doesn't matter in, you know, in most, most mammals, maybe not, not, not modern humans, but in most mammals, whether the future survival of, a, of the mother doesn't really make much difference to the father because the father is usually promiscuous, is not, you know, is not, a, is not taking care of the young, is not staying with the female. In most mammals, including most primates, um, this promiscuity, the father mates, and then just sort of goes off, you know, leaves them to their own devices and goes off and finds other females. And so his fitness is not really greatly affected if the mother basically is so you know, weakened by a fast growing fetus that she doesn't reproduce very well in the future. You know, he, he can go on and mate with different females. So that means then that genes from the father could favor high growth and survival of their own offspring. Whereas genes from the mother that are carried by that offspring would be advantageous if they slowed down the growth rate and didn't make such a great demand on the mother. And it turns out that there are two genes that are at least two genes that are known that have exactly these opposite effects, okay? Then this gene, which, it, which makes the fetus grow faster, then the, the allele that comes from the mother is turned off, it's silenced, it's not activated in the fetus, okay? And, and that is advantageous for the mother because it's keeping the growth down at a reasonable pace. Whereas another gene, which reduces the rate of fetal growth by opposing the IgA2 gene, the first gene, it suppresses it, 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 it. This reduces fetal growth, okay? And that gene, if it comes from the father, is silenced because from the father's point of view, that is not a very useful gene. You want, your, you want that fetus to grow fast and... and, and so, um, so it turns out that if these two genes aren't really in sync with, aren't properly interacting at the right level, then you get path pathologies in the fetus, okay? And so you get what are called rapid growth pathologies. One of them even has this name and here's, here's, a, here's a, 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 an infant affected by it because 
the father's gene and the mother's gene should each be opposing one another, but in balance, as you see at the top, okay? But if one or the other gets out of balance, as you see at the bottom, it could be you know, pushed beyond the optimal level from the father or beyond the optimal level for the mother. And the result is that it messes up, it alters the fetal, the, the fetal growth. And so here's, you know, here's a, a, a horrible kind of, of medical, medically important defect that it can be understood from the perspective of evolutionary genetics, of the theory of genetic conflict. Okay. So what I've tried to convey in this talk is that evolution, the, the, the growing theory and evidence on evolution is profoundly important. It's profoundly important for the biological sciences at, as a whole because it enhances our understanding of everything from genomes to animal behavior and physiology. And it's important in human affairs. You know, especially I've been focusing on medical, uh, medically re health related issues, but of course there are other issues as well. And so I, I'm going to close with quotations from two truly great biologists. Theodosius Dobzhansky was one of the great evolutionary geneticists of the 20th century. And so you would ex expect him to praise evolution and say how important it was. And him, he wrote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Francois Jacob, a French geneticist who studied bacteria, shared the Nobel Prize, not for studying evolution, but for learning how genes are regulated, how they're turned on and off and activated or deactivated in bacteria. This was a profoundly important discovery. But Jacob, you know, was a, he was a broad thinker and he wrote, there are many generalizations in biology, but precious few theories. See how, he, see how him, important he think, thinks a theory is. Okay. Precious few theories in biology. Among these, however, the theory of evolution is by far the most important because it draws together this great mass of observations. It unites all the disciplines that are concerned with living beings. It provides an explanation of the living world and its variation, its heterogeneity. It is the most important theory in biology. Thank you very much. Um, that's the end of my talk. And shall I stop share, Fabricio? Thank you. Hi, Douglas. Was a wonderful talk. A lot of people are thanking you here. They are very impressive. Okay. <laughs> Some people expected you to be Japanese because- uh, of Yes, yes, everyone does. I will, <laughs> I, I, in case, if anyone would like to know, my grandfather came from Ukraine. Ukra how you say, Ukraina? Ukraina. Ukraina, okay. That is where my grandfather came. But Wonderful. I, I have here a lot of questions, but I have questions myself. No, before that, I just give a, a message uh, in Portuguese. Uh, essa palestra, né, ela está no YouTube, depois de ser processada, vai ser transcrita, né? a transcrição em inglês aparece no YouTube, depois de tudo processado, para quem tiver dificuldade aí com o inglês, tá bom? Inclusive, dá para traduzir a, a legenda que vai sair, que não é uma legenda, é uma transcrição. I'm just talking about the YouTube, that people who didn't understand something, they can see the transcription of your talk. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, we have a lot of questions here. I, I have one. Uh, a lot of scientists today, they suggest that modern science has revolutionized the biological field, you know, in a way that we should need a special revision of the evolutionary theory. There is a, someone in the audience, audience here, Thais Quintão, she said that your book changed there a lot in the last editions. You know? So what do you think about the proposal of an uh, extended synthesis? Um, so, um, of course, okay, well, <laughs> we could talk. I have talked for an hour about this topic uh, at, at, on other occasions. Um, we, we have to understand that all sciences continually are changing. Okay, this is true of, you know, of every science. You, to a large extent, that means we are learning more, especially as we have greater techniques and methods. So, for example, 
you know, 20 years ago, we couldn't sequence genomes. So we couldn't say very much about genomes, but now that information we have because of the technical advances, and that is helping us understand many, many things, not just about the genome, but many, many other things as well. So a great deal of change that you would see in the different editions of my textbook is simply because of the natural, the natural uh, advance, if you like, or evolution of the, of, of the field as we learn more. But of course, it is also the case that ideas change. And I think it's very important for any scientist, for anyone really, but especially a scientist, never to say that we have proved something. That, that you know, we don't have proof in science the way you have proof in, proof in mathematics. Okay, you, you know, you, you can have a simple proof in, in mathematics and it, 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 you know, guaranteed that is the way it is. But in science, we always have to bear in mind the possibility that our explanation is incomplete. Conceivably, there's going to be some revolutionary discovery that changes everything, you know, but that almost never really, really happens, okay? That, it, that you change everything. But, but, but it is, but it, of course, it's very common that we recognize that with, as new information or even sometimes new mathematical modeling comes along and says, well, what ye, we thought we knew this, but it's really more complicated than that. There are more dimensions, there are more considerations, or it works this way in some kinds of, of, organ, of species, but it works a different way in other kinds of species. Um, for example, the, problem, the question of how new species form is a, one of these questions goes on forever because it's very, very complicated. And we're continually learning that, there's, we, that there are more things we don't understand about species, species speciation or even what species are depending on different groups of organisms. Um, in the recent past, and perhaps, perhaps the, the person who posed this question is referring to the fact that there have been calls in the recent past for a new expanded evolutionary synthesis. Um, and my reaction to that has been that the evolutionary synthesis has been expanding ever since the so-called evolutionary synthesis was formed in the 1950s. Throughout my entire life as a student and then you know, as, as, a, as, as a researcher, there has been an expansion of evolutionary, of evolutionary biology. When I was a graduate student, we were really first beginning to merge together ecology and evolutionary biology to form, you know, if you like, a new wing of evolutionary biology, which is understanding life histories and various features of, of ecology that had an evolutionary dimension. So there's been, there's been expansion of that kind um, all along. Some of the expansion that is being called for now is in light of phenomena that are being discovered, such, for example, there's something called epigenetic marking of genes. In which, a, um, in which a gene may have a slight chemical modification, so it either is being um, activated at a higher level or it is being sort of turned off and deactivated. And that happens, it's one of the ways in which, the, in which you know, different members of the same species might be slightly different in some characteristics because they have undergone differential marking of their genes, different markings of their genes. We now know that some of, sometimes those marks can be carried over from one generation to the next generation. And that would mean a kind of inheritance, which is not just the DNA sequence, but also the, the sort of the, the phenotypic condition of the, the mother or the father may be carried over into the offspring. It would be a, a particular um, instance of what, what have been called maternal effects of many kinds that have been understood for a long time. How important this process is remains to be seen, okay? And some people are saying, this is going to totally change everything. My reaction is no, but it's going to, it's going to slightly modify the way we have to talk about inheritance and, uh, and evolution in the short term. Yeah, I think people don't realize that science changes all the time. No? All the time, all the time. But uh, some two decades ago, you have organized a book, a book about uh, science, evolution science and society you know, in the US that we have translated to Portuguese by the Brazilian Society of Genetics has organized it and we translated this booklet that you organized there in the US. 
But now in Brazil, we are seeing so many fallacious arguments, fake news, and other pseudo scientific thoughts getting projection in media. How do you deal with lay people, but also with biologists, scientists, and teachers that are bringing back these ideas? The well, this of course, this this is this, this is in the U.S. This has now been a problem for a very long time. Not with scientists. There are very, very, very few scientists who are denying evolution. Okay, um, there was one fellow who he made a career out of of uh, you know of, of denying evolution, and he said, you know, I have a PhD in biology. Yeah, he did have a PhD in biochemistry. But even even when he talked about biochemical evolution, he was wrong, you know, because he didn't he, you know, he, he didn't he didn't uh, keep up with the field. Um, one of the great evolutionary biologists, Ernst Meyer, um, said he wrote at one point that everybody every, everybody seems to think he's an expert on evolution, whether or not he has any training in biology, much less evolutionary biology. Every everyone everyone thinks they, they they're an expert. Um, well, I'm sorry, it's a complicated subject. And I, some of what I think you saw in my presentation shows that it can be really complicated. Genetic conflict, you know, whoever heard of that? You know, that's pretty complicated. So, um, uh, so how do you deal with this? Communicating with the population, as you say, the lay public, um, the, here, it is, it, it's one of, one of the, I have to say the very sad thing is that for 40 years at least, um, in fact, more than that, it's, 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 it's you know, it, it, at least 50 years. Biologists such as myself have been trying to convey in various ways why, what the evidence for evolution is and how important it is. We've been, written books, we've written articles, we've, you know, it, it, all, all kinds of efforts. The National Academy of Sciences of the US, you know, put out a pamphlet which summarizes all these arguments. Um, and there has been no change at all when you know when people the population is polled and they ask you know what is the fraction of people who accept evolution or deny evolution there's essentially no change at all it's you know so it seems as if it seems as if we academic people do not know how to communicate to the larger population and um, and I, I don't think I don't I don't have I don't have any answer to that. I, I I'm sure there are certainly people who are more capable, who are better than I am. I think at talking to people at, at large. Um, so I don't know. What I don't understand is how how a scientist could deny evolution unless that scientist has a very biased pre you know, prior, biased point of view from some other kind of perspective. Because I, I, as, as I've, I've tried to point out here, the variety of different kinds of evidence, and I, I only scratched the surface, the variety of kinds of evidence, the amount of evidence for evolution is so overwhelming, how you could possibly deny it, I don't understand. Um, I would actually at, uh, um, uh, like to, at this point to recommend a book. If it's not translated into Portuguese, it should be. And this is a book by Jerry Coyne, C-O-Y-N-E, called Why Evolution is True, okay? And it is a short book. It is beautifully written. It conveys magnificently the, evolu the various, the many, many kinds of evidence for evolution. Um, and so that is a book I would very strongly recommend, Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne, C-O-Y-N-E. Yes, I believe there is a translation to Portuguese for that. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, it's a wonder, wonderful book. Yeah. There are many questions from the audience. Oh, there is another, there is one here that's very technical, but it's a common question that appears because there are some phylogenetic analysis of genetics and morphology that bring back, they, they come up with different topologies, different ways of thinking. So he's saying, how do we deal with these different or discrepant ideas? So, Phylogenetic, phylogenetic analyses, the, the, the coming up with the, the history of, an, of ancestry is a very complicated topic. Um, there are many different methods that have been used for analyzing. There are two issues. One is what kind of data do you have? Um, and, how will, how, and, and then the second is how to analyze those data. And there are many, many different approaches that have been suggested. 
And they, like anything else, each of them has sort of certain strengths and certain weaknesses. Um, the, one of the issues, of course, is that, it, that if the data is based on morphology, if it's based on anatomical characteristics, that these, that often you, there are a rather small number of characteristics that can actually be used. And we also know that there are that there are evolutionary processes such as what's called convergent evolution, independent, independently different different species evolve a very very similar characteristic. Um, so that uh, so that the amount of information that is available from uh, from anatomy and morphology is somewhat is somewhat limited. The amount of information that is available from the genome is enormous. And so, if and and so, one way, of course, you could look and see if I look at different parts of the genome and many, many different parts, um, do I tend to get the same answer, or do I get radically different answers all the time? Um, the um, I in in general, I think most people would say that if you have a, a phylogeny based on a lot of genomic data, and it conflicts with a phylogeny based on the anatomical and other characteristics of the organism, the genomic approach is probably going to be closer to the truth. Um, just be, be, for a number of reasons, and part of it is simply just the amount of information. Um, so I gave that example in the case of the vertebrates where there is a beautiful correspondence, okay? But I can certainly also find examples from within certain groups of birds, for example, or within certain groups of, 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 um, of fishes where there is not such a great correspondence. And, but I think we understand why that would be the case. Okay. There is another question in my field of work, that's human evolution. Vanderlei Soares is saying, consider the high mobility of humans currently, now we have all of this migration in the last five centuries, the sign of more diverging populations compared to Africa still remains? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite... Because he is talking about the, the current diversity with gene flow from different continents populating different countries. No? Yeah. So he's just comparing that map that you show about indigenous populations and asking. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, obviously, if you, if you did exactly that study, but you just chose people at random, um, it, would be, it would look quite different. In North America, we would see a lot of, a lot of, of admixture from Africa because of the, the very unfortunate history of, of, of slavery here. Um, in South America, when, or for that matter, in North America, you would be seeing a lot of, <laughs> you would be see, you're, you're seeing European genes, you know? Um, uh, and, the same, and the same obviously is true in, in, uh, in Brazil. You know, you are so famous as a country for you know being having people from such a mixture of different wonderful mixture of of, uh, of different peoples, um, and so that so that map is very very importantly. I should have said this that very importantly that we were talking there about indigenous populations being sampled. Um, so a sample of just indigenous populations from from Brazil or the United States would be very different from just a random sample of people today in those places. No, I, I fully agree. You, you, yeah. Yeah. We have a question from Bigfoot here. He's in the audience. So uh, he's talking about the contributions of, of the genome science to evolutionary biology. And he is asking, will we vindicate Ernest Mayer notion of an integrative view of the organism? as opposed to the gen-centered gen view. <laughs> well, this, 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 I think this is an issue that almost, it, it almost even gets into, into some philosophy, if you like, more, more than biology. Um, the, uh, there's no question that, uh, so let's back up. Um, Ernst Meyer, I think like any organismal biologist or like any developmental biologist would recognize that genes are, are not just each gene does its own little thing and that the organism is simply different pieces, each with certain genes making that piece, but rather 
the, 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 you know, the formation of any feature in organism involves elaborate interacting pathways of genes that are interacting with one another. Some genes are controlling the action of, of, of other genes. Some of them are working together that, you know, to form things. So an eye, for example, you have the, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the lens of the eye is induced by the optic cup underneath it. So it, the process of formation of an organism is very integrated as, as, as he says. Okay, um, and it, that kind of interaction, that kind of complexity is very, very difficult to map out and to, to, to draw a kind of diagram of that complexity. This is something that many, uh, many geneticists are doing, of course, very actively. And so at this point in, in the last 20 years or so, as genomics has advanced, as we're able to, you know, to, for every place in the genome of a Drosophila fruit fly, and I think at this point, almost every, every gene in the human genome, they can say, this gene has a role here and here and here in the formation of the organism. And so there are many parts of the organism in which we can sort of see the very elaborate ways in which the genes are interacting with, with, with one another. And that is one of the beauties of, 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 of genomics. I, 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 earlier on, I alluded to the fact that we could learn so much more you know, from having genomes you know, over and above uh, just you know, ph phylogenetic information. So, so this then raises many interesting questions, okay? To what extent, if you have evolution at one gene that is affecting some characteristic, here's a characteristic in which a certain change in the characteristic improves survival, let's say, okay? And that characteristic develops as a result of the interaction, the interplay among a number of different genes, what is called epistasis, okay? Um, the question then becomes, how is it possible for one gene to evolve, you know, to have a mutational change that has some impact on the characteristic, is it necessary then for the other genes to make adjustments as well so that you get corresponding evolution in the other genes? So this would be the case, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of mathematical theory of this. When I talked about evolutionary theory, some of it is very mathematical and they're very elaborate mathematical theories that I don't understand at all um, about, about the evolution of groups of interacting genes. And we know that that kind of epistasis goes on. And we certainly have examples in which it could be shown that the course of evolution has been affected by these kinds of interactions. Okay. Here's one kind of, one kind of study that's being, that has been done a number of times, which is beautiful. You take the phylogeny and have a certain, a certain gene, let's say for hemoglobin. And you look at the different species in that phylogeny and you see that, oh, well, there are five, you know, three or four differences in the hemoglobin molecule between this species and that species. You can use in, in these different species, let's say of geese, okay, of, 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 of birds called geese. And um, you can use the phylogeny to estimate what the sequence of the hemoglobin was in the ancestor of all those goose species. And then you can actually now synthesize, you can basically do gene editing to then create that ancestral sequence, first of all, um, and have it gr growing in a cell, a cell, cell line and producing, you know, and, and, and producing hemoglobin. And, um, and, um, and then you can do gene editing so that you change each piece that has actually changed during the course of evolution from the ancestor to the various living species today. And for each step, you change it individually, or then you can change two, two of them, and, or maybe three of places in the gene. And you ask, does this improve the function of the protein or does it, does it harm, you reduce the function of the protein? And, you know, and so it is now possible to really recreate experimentally the evolution of a gene which has, di which has become different at a number of different places in the gene affecting several different amino acids in the protein, which the gene encodes, and see how the diversity among among that of that gene among living species, how, what are the possible pathways by which those several differences could have evolved? And what you find is some of those pathways would not work. 
in order for the mutation that, you know, in, in place number 15 in the gene, in order for that mutation to make a better protein, it must already have had a change at, you know, position number 37, okay? So there are certain sequences of mutations which will improve the function step by step, but other sequences which simply won't. In fact, it would diminish the function. And because of the way in which those different mutations that all together in the final product are working together to give a better, a better hemoglobin, okay, for, 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 at, at, this, this has been done for studying the hemoglobin of birds and other, uh, or, and humans for that matter, at high altitudes, where you have a special hemoglobin that's really good at, at picking up oxygen at very low, low levels. Um, and, so, uh, and so this is an example, even within one gene, about how interactions among the different possible, you know, the, the different sites in that gene can either enable evolution to happen by natural selection or be forbidden. You know, that just wouldn't happen. Well, we have another complex question here by Danilo Pinhal. So you know about this idea of individual as a holobiont, no, a mixture with microorganisms. So he's, he's asking, what do you think about the hologenome theory of evolution? Well, I, this is not an area in which I claim any expertise, okay? However, some of my friends are very much experts in this area. Nancy Moran, for example, at the University of Texas um, is, you know, one of, one of several, uh, several um, uh, uh, people, uh, there were several people at the University of Rochester and Cornell and so forth. And their reaction is that this is really kind of silly and they don't, they don't think that the holobiont idea should be taken seriously. Okay, now what, so let's, let's back up. And so, um, and I, I, you know, I respect their views very, very much. They are really good scientists and, and I really respect their views. Um, so, <clears throat> so this idea is, for example, the human being, you know, I am, you know, I, they say, I am not I, I am we, I am myself plus my, my thousands of species of bacteria that live in my gut and on my skin and you know, on my face and in my, in my teeth and you know, on my teeth and so forth. So I am, that is what they call the holobiont. It's you know, myself plus all of my many, many microbes. Okay? And some of those microbes do indeed have an impact on the function of the human being or the, you know, the host, let's call. Um, and of course, some of those microbes are fighting with one another for resources and the, there are very, very complicated things going on. What you have, if you like, is an ecosystem um, in the gut and another, sort of another small ecosystem on the surface, parts of the surface of the skin. And there's a great deal of really important ecology that's happening there of the same kind that is studied by, by ecosystem and community ecologists. However, for this to be considered a unitary organism, that's the holo part of the holo biont, um, it, you know, there's, there, there has to be some kind of feedback. In other words, to what extent does, um, does the evolution, let's say, of, you know, the, the, of the human host depend on, chain, on evolutionary changes in these various bacteria? Or to what, you know, is there feedback between what is good for certain species of bacteria and what would be good for, for the human host or for, the, you know, for the, the fly host or whatever it is. My friends, Nancy Moran and, 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 um, and others argue that so far we have very little evidence for such feedback, that much of what is happening among the microbes in the gut or on the skin or in, you know, in the mouth or whatever, much of what's happening there is just, a, that, that, you know, that concerns those bacteria, but it doesn't really have necessarily a very huge impact on the human being. And consequently, and, or conversely, evolutionary changes, genetic differences among humans that, that are advantageous or disadvantageous aren't necessarily going to have very much of an impact on the composition of this, mi of this microbiome. There will certainly be some individual species that may respond, but the idea that this is a strongly integrated system in which everything depends on everything else and everything is going to react to changes in everything else, there is so far, as far as, as, far as I know from, from, from what they are saying, Angela Douglas is another such person at Cornell, for example, from what they are saying, there, there just is not, not evidence for that kind of deep integration 
Um, so this is, let's make the analogy to the last question where we, the last question was to what extent are we talking about deep integrated interactions among different genes in a genome that go into making a functioning fly or a functioning plant or a functioning human being. And there it is clear that there are subsets of genes which really are very strongly integrated with one another you know, to form an eye or to you know, influence the development of a tooth um, or in various aspects of the physiology of, 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 of the fly or the human. Um, and it is, but it is not clear that you have that same degree of interaction and, 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 and integration in the, between the host and the microbes and among the various microbes. Well, we are getting to the end. So we, ha we have two more questions. So the next one is about uh, human evolution and evolutionary medicine that you talked about. So I can, can give you my experience when I was doing biology, you know, I was having classes in human physiology. You no, know? so we were using in the practices, frogs, rabbits, mice, you no, know? but to the professor, the teacher, he never talked about evolution. He never explained the basis, the fundamentals behind that. So my opinion, you know, as a professor of evolution, of genetics, human genetics, you no, know, I think all biological disciplines, doesn't matter the course, should focus on fundamental explanations of the evolution behind each phenomenon process you know, in physiology, biochemistry, ecology, zoology, botany, everything. So I think it's missing. No, so even for a doctor, for a medical doctor uh, and other professions, they should all know about what is behind the, the phenomena. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, I mean, you ought to know why, if you're interested in medicine, why are you studying the anatomy of a rat or a frog? You know, they, I mean, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, of course it does. It makes sense only because of this history, this common history, you know, that, uh, that we share with them. You know, what is even more amazing, there was this one experiment done in which um, the study of yeast, okay? So this is a, this is a fungus, right? A one-celled one -cell, one fungus. And they went through and many, many, many of the genes in a yeast are equivalent to genes in the human. It's amazing to think about that. You know, yeast that we make beer out of, <laughs> you know, we use for making beer um, or for cooking, okay, baking. And they went through and basically replaced one by one by one, at one at a time, a yeast gene, and they put in the equivalent human gene instead. And in many, many cases, I think even a majority of cases, the yeast was able to function using a human gene. Okay. I think that is simply staggering. The, you know, I mean, if there were not for evolution, how could you possibly, how would you, would you ever predict such a thing? That human that that yeast could use human genes in order to carry out its life. Yeah. So our last question here is about also to our next topic. We have a, a next session in Portuguese with two very nice guys, professors here uh, about the nihilism, pseudoscience, and things like that. So Nélio Bizo is one of them. He's making this this question here. Creationists are trying to pass laws to introduce compulsory science lessons of the allegedly theory of creationists based on the principle of freedom of thought. Do you think that this makes any sense? Uh, I would be somewhat reluctant to say what should be done in education in Brazil because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a citizen of your country. And I think that there are going to be cultural and historical and social aspects that I am not familiar with and that I, that I really should not. You know, so, so I don't think I can give an informed answer. I can speak to the situation in my country. Okay. Um, but my country may be rather different in the sense that we have a constitution, the, the, the basic rules of, you know, of law of the United States. And the first, in, the first in, amendment, the first part of that constitution framed in 19, 1776, the most important thing for them was what we now call separation of church and state. 
that they basically said that the state will not respect any particular religion. It will not. It will not. It will not establish any of its laws with an eye to whether they are approved in conflict or approved by any or by any religion. And they will not allow religious teaching in any public in public school. There will not be any religious practice in any kind of governmental organization and so on. And so in the United States, this has been the basis on which in any state supported school, um, there have been many, many efforts to introduce creation thinking or religion, religion based thinking into teaching science and biology in public schools in the United States. And in every case, the court, it has been, it has gone, gone through the legal system. And in every case, the court has said, you cannot do that because that is in opposition to the United States Constitution. In religious schools, you know, schools that, you know, that are actually run by, by religious groups, there is no, there is no kind of, of legal, legal restriction. And so, of course, there they very often they teach some, you know, creationism, or maybe they do both evolution, and then they say, well, no, but now that's, that's what evolution now will tell you what's really true, which is the religious creation version. And so there's no law against that. Now, I what do I think about that? I you know I think well they you know they have the freedom to do that. Um, I do not think that they are doing their students a good service by denying the science and teaching their students really not to respect the scientific method and the uh, uh, and the basis and the whole concept of arriving at a belief or an understanding based on evaluating evidence. This is so important, I cannot begin to say how important it is. Science is always, number one, we've said it's always slightly uncertain, it's always possible that we're a little bit off, we're a little wrong, we, you know, we don't understand it fully, okay? We always allow that, but at all times, we say we accept this hypothesis with a certain amount of confidence, not 100%, but like maybe 99% confidence. We accept this because of the evidence, okay? Because there, if there are different ideas and we ask to what extent does evidence match this idea versus that idea, okay? I believe that the most important thing about science, teaching science is teaching people how to think and how to respect or how to build their understanding and their belief system on evidence instead of pure emotion or wishing that something were so. I believe that is so important. And I, to step away from evolution and from biology for a moment, I want to say that what we have seen in my country over the last several years and specifically on the <clears throat> inauguration day, January 26th, what we saw happening, and I'm sure you all have seen this in the news, what you saw was you know, with the mob of people attacking the, the great temple <laughs> of government in my country. That stems largely from people not evaluating evidence. It stems from people being told by a certain person that, that you know, the, the election has been stolen and everyone's sort of going with that be, and believing that not because of evidence, but because that's, because that's what they wanted to believe. It's out of their wishes or out of their feeling, out of their emotions, okay? This is so dangerous, I can't begin to tell you. And it happens in, you know, as a consequence of not having been taught and not having accepted the idea that you judge the evidence. What is the quality of the information you are getting? What is the quality of the source of this information? What kind of evidence is being presented to you, um, you know, of one claim versus another claim? This is so important. This is what science, what science does all the time, all the time. Anyone who, sub who submits a research paper to a scientific journal making a certain claim about what they have discovered. This is the way. This is the way the gene works, or whatever. Any such paper goes through a process of peer review of other scientists who will try to find out if there are any faults in this claim. 
How strong is this claim? Okay, does it really look as if it meets all the you know all the standards that that it has to meet in order for us to accept it as being as being you know a solid believable piece of work? Okay, sometimes papers do get through in which it's discovered that there are flaws. There were the, that there was something about the way the data were collected or the way the data were analyzed or something so that there is reason to believe that it's not as strong a study as it appeared on first sight and. People who discover that will publish a paper and they will partly build their reputation on the basis of showing how, you know, how careful they are and how sharp they were to be, to be able to find mistakes. And so science works through a, a process of competition among scientists to basically come up with the truth. You know, to, to, to verify, to, you know, always to check, to, you know, to see how strong is this claim? Is this really true? Is this really the way the genes work? Or is, or is there something that, you know, that is wrong, that is off? That is, that is what you learn by being a scientist, is to always have a little bit of doubt, always demand evidence, always being willing to say, this is uncertain or this is wrong. We're going to have to revise our ideas. What you would never do as a scientist is to simply accept something because so-and-so says so. Whether that so-and-so is a famous scientist, just because they say it does not necessarily mean it is true. If that so-and-so is a social leader or whatever, you know, you don't accept something simply on the basis of authority. Yeah, exactly. In Brazil, the law is the same. No, but we have a, a recent movement to create a non-party school, no, like a, a free-thinking school that you can say anything because our ideas are important. Everything matters in the science class. So you can imagine what's happening here. No, people are confusing opinion and evidence. Right. So that's the whole confusion. That is, that, is, that is so important to make that distinction, so important. So you know, we will discuss even, a lot. Even you know, even the opinion of someone who you you know who you respect, you know, it, it's like they can be wrong. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, my yeah, we need to do yeah. uh, self reflection all the time about our past papers yeah. because they are all published. That's you right. just say That's foolish, right. rubbish. Right. Yeah, no, some some of my some of what I published, I I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, recommend that you read them today. <laughs> Well, you, you need to read to see the mistakes, not to, to make the same. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> That's true. Well, so again, thank you very much. It was wonderful people here are loving your presentation, your talk. Well, I, 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 hope. I hope so. I, as I say, I it would be I would it, to do this. You know, obviously far better than not at all. But it would be you know to actually talk to people face to face is 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 you know so much more rewarding. And all I can say is to all of you who have listened to and watched my talk, thank you very, very much for, for your attention. And uh, thank you, you know, just really very much for being interested in what I think is such a fascinating and important topic and, and subject. So, and thank you, Fabricio. Um, and um, goodbye now. Tchau, muito obrigado. I'm talking Portuguese. Muito, muito obrigado, obrigado, senhores. Então vamos, fiquem aí no canal que vai entrar é, a, a nova, o novo debate aí, a mesa redonda sobre negacionismo, né? Então a gente vai, vai mudar a plataforma aqui, vai demorar só uns dois, três minutinhos. Tchau, vai.